thought today, after all those very big brain talks, we'd go a little easier and just talk about markets, uh, reviewing recent market trends, examining a few indicators that I think are pretty interesting to explain what's going on and set up, uh, walk through a few fundamental trends that I think are really great, and then wrap that up into how that all informs our market view. So why don't we go ahead, market review. Uh, I don't know if people remember, but we actually started the year on a pretty optimistic note. We were riding high post-election. Everyone was really excited about uh, you know, what U.S. policy could do for this industry. But inauguration became one of those classic crypto, buy the rumor, sell the news events. And here we are. On an, uh, since, the, since that, the first few months of the year have been really challenging. Right? Uh, there's been a pullback across every asset class. S&P and Bitcoin were both down 15 to 20% at the lows. That's a very large pullback. Um, and why is that? Well, macro is in the driver's seat, and crypto hasn't been immune. You know, tariffs have been by far the biggest driver of the price action. Uh, you, know, you can see it in the price chart there. It's every tariff action has resulted in a down leg, and really culminating in uh, our beautiful new Liberation Day on April 2nd. Uh, together, that with Doge has really created a uh, fear of stagflation. What is stagflation? Well, it's you know, lower growth, higher inflation. That's bad. Uh, Regardless of whether or not you agree with these policies, what is certain is that this is a radical departure from any prior administration, from anything that's happened before, and so it creates uncertainty. When you're uncertain as an investor, as a risk manager, your job is to evaluate probabilities of what's going to happen. If you have less certainty, then your probability of success is lower and you're supposed to pull back. So people sold. Uh, as we look forward, it's really important to realize, though, that this tariff-driven pullback is self-manufactured. Just like it was you know, artificially injected in, so too can it be unilaterally taken out with a quick true social tweet. And the recent series of tariff concessions really speak to that rebound, um, even though there is a lot of uncertainty. Let's put, this rebound, let's, let's put this pullback in context, though. The reality is we've been here before. During every bull market, there are at least four or five 20, 30 percent pullbacks in Bitcoin and you know, 40, 40 to 50 percent pullbacks in everything else. To some extent, people in crypto who are still here, everyone here has Stockholm syndrome. That's an advantage, truly. The ability to sit through crazy volatility and is really critical to compounding returns on a longer term time period. As you can see, that has been true so far. In the table on the top, top left or top right here, um, we show what, what quarterly returns look like in crypto, and after every single negative quarter, there's usually a strong rebound. The strength of that rebound and you know, the drivers of that rebound obviously depend on sentiment, positioning, underlying fundamentals, so let's walk into all of that. I think this is a great indicator to start with. Tariffs have created uncertainty, but like how much? It's like historic high levels of uncertainty. The U.S. Economic Policy Uncertainty Index measures like the amount of uncertainty as judged by, judged by media. And it is as high today as it was during COVID, right? When literally no one knew what was going on. That's pretty crazy. It's higher today than it was during the great financial crisis, the 9-11. This is historic levels of uncertainty. So it's times like these when you really have to ask yourself, and it's really helpful to remember the Buffett quote, you know, is it, you be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. Is, is, that, is it that time? As an investor, you need to ask then, well, not just what is the absolute level right now, clearly things look bad, but what is the directionality of that change? And that tells you where things are going to go. So let me run you through a few more indicators that, that suggest we're at pretty extreme levels. The first, crypto fear and greed index. This you know, multivariate model that, that, that tells how people are feeling within the crypto markets, it's at extreme fear levels. It hasn't seen this level since FTX went bust in 2022. Binance purpose positioning for Bitcoin currently near flat or near negative. What this shows is the relative number of longs versus shorts in the market. At that level, people are relatively short as opposed to long. Again, only happened during massive pullbacks and always preceded by a large rebound. Next, this is, a, this is overall retail sentiment, sentiment for US equity investors. There's a survey that people take, they ask them over the next six months, are you bullish, are you bearish? 60% of US retail investors think they're bearish. That's only happened during the massive, massive pullbacks in 2022, 2009, 2090, or 1990. Like, this is historic extremes and number of market sentiment indicators. That suggests to me, I don't know, but it suggests to me that we're probably past the initial stages of aggressive selling. On the flip side, on the positive side, the rates of liquidity picture is getting a lot better. 
The U.S. 10-year Treasury rate may be higher for longer, but that's actually Scott Besson, U.S. Treasury Secretary Scott Besson's number one priority is getting the 10-year rate down. So rates may be higher for longer, but definitely going down over time. On the liquidity front, this is global liquidity, the amount of money that governments are creating. U.S. Europe started stimulus. I mean, they were forced to by Trump because they've got to start spending on defense now. China started stimulus. Their economy is not doing so great. U.S. is currently going, going to quickly go from quantitative tightening and quantitative easing. So the three largest geographies are, are about to start quantitative easing and adding liquidity to the market. All this is really good for risk assets. And it's particularly good for Bitcoin. I charted right here global M2 or liquidity against Bitcoin price action. And any time there has been a large surge in Bitcoin, it's been also coincident with a large surge in global liquidity. And it really shows that Bitcoin is a risk on asset that benefits from liquidity con conditions. And Another thing to keep in mind is that this is a very historic macro moment and Bitcoin performs well in those conditions. You have to go back to understanding what is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a non-sovereign store of value. It doesn't mean that it's like a stable store of value. As we all know in here, it's not a stable store of value, but it is a non-sovereign one. So it's one that people go to when they lose trust in what's going on in the world and when there's uncertainty. Bitcoin has performed very well every four years. I think a lot of people potentially misattribute that to the Bitcoin halvening. The reality, and as a student of history, it, you just ha it's actually happened that the macro cycles have followed this weird coincident four-year major macro event every four years that really emphasizes Bitcoin's value proposition, right? 2012, Eurozone debt crisis. 2016, Brexit. 2020, COVID. Today, tariffs. Each of the events really, really gave people reasons to own more Bitcoin and own more non-sovereign stores of value. The current de-dollarization is one such theme. And by the way, funny thing is, like I, we're talking a lot about tariffs, but as much as digital assets, uh, as much as we talk about t tariffs, digital assets are virtual and borderless. No one's getting tariffed. So it's not fundamentally impacted at all and can't be tariffed. And indeed, we're already seeing, starting to see signs of relative strength as, we, as we've come out, right? After Liberation Day in April, we've already seen, started to see really strong price action out of Bitcoin, Solana, which have wildly outperformed equities, which are still down. So that's all good. I really do believe that just like the tip of the spear, digital assets, first of all, hardest to fall, but will be the first to rebound and can rebound the hardest. To, for that to actually happen, though, we also have to realize that there are good events going on. This past quarter probably saw the most positive industry events in our history as an industry. Strategic, U.S. strategic Bitcoin reserve, SEC cases getting dropped, restrictive regulatory rules being rescinded. Crypto had the most positive headlines in its history, and yet it had one of the most worst quarters in performance in its history. That tells me the good news is definitely not priced in. So let's look at a few like, interesting fundamentals, because I do think I, I, I'm a really you know, religiously fundamental investor, if you will. I care that we're creating value and actually creating products that people want to use and ultimately producing you know, real cash flow in this business. Um, and just this, I, I think a lot of people in crypto like to say, ah, fundamentals don't matter, it's all memes. But the reality is, even this past quarter, revenue generating tokens outperformed non-revenue generating tokens by 10%. That is a very large gap. And we're starting to see that gap increasingly widen. So let me walk through a few things that I think are super interesting right now. First, high level picture, what's going on? L1s, they're producing about a billion and a half free cash flow annualized now. Decentralized apps, they're producing about $3 billion of annualized free cash flow and growing quarter over quarter. That's pretty crazy when you think about it. When I talk to institutional investors, they always ask me, are there real businesses here? And I tell them, look, these businesses are generating $15 billion of free cash flow. That's a real damn business, right? Crypto is actually becoming very, very profitable. Active addresses, which is you know, a weak proxy for users, not the best, but certainly directional, has been increasing over time. Stable points, increasing over time. A double click on stable points. I do think this is one of the best instantiations of crypto's power as global financial rails. Why are stablecoins important? They have four properties versus status quo. They make money movement faster. They make money movement cheaper. They make it open, permissionless, and global day one. And they make it composable. All those things combine to enable really tangible use cases. We can walk through a few of them. Everyone from corporates to consumers are using them. Corporates, multinational companies like SpaceX are using stablecoins to manage their global treasury. Instead of having money stuck in various countries, having to send wires back and forth, you get instant stablecoin settlements. Like your CFO is ecstatic about that. For, for immigrants who are living in the US or, or Dubai, send money back home. They're using stablecoins for remittance. Way better than banking rails. 
or people in emerging markets. Over $100 billion of these stablecoins exist in emerging markets because people want US dollar denominated savings. That's very powerful. There's been this also incorrect perception that crypto is somehow bad for the US dollar and the US government. Uh, that, 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 that incorrect is now being corrected. And that's being recognized by our government. The reality is stablecoins and crypto have been one of the best things for the US and the US dollar. I see a lot of people in the crowd, a lot of international people. I bet all of you price Bitcoin in dollars, right? Not your local currency. That says a lot. Another area that we find super interesting, DPIT, Decentralized Physical Infrastructure Networks. Whenever large institutional allocators, it's your endowments, your sovereign wealth funds, when they're talking to me, they ask two questions. One, where the, why blockchain? And two, where are the use cases? Deepin is the best instantiation of that. These are, Deepin protocols are delivering real businesses uh, with, with, with a cheaper, better cost than what legacy incumbents can do. And they're generating real revenues. You know, we're close to a zero a year ago, but now we're getting close to 100 million of annualized revenue across Deepin protocols. And these, their customers include large corporates and governments, which is pretty crazy, right? Some of the examples are like Helium, Helium is being paid by AT&T and T-Mobile. These are Fortune 500 companies that decided Helium protocol, Deepin protocol and crypto is delivering a better service than we can produce ourselves, even though we're a $100 billion company. HiveMapper, servicing the largest mapping companies. You know, the lar one, of the global, one of the world's largest ride-sharing companies paying HiveMapper for their mapping data because it's better than what other mapping providers can provide. GeoNet, Ge GeoNet actually has a program with the U.S. Department of Agriculture where U.S. farmers actually get subsidized to buy GeoNet equipment by the US government. I don't think people realize that the US government is paying crypto protocols because they're delivering a better, cheaper service for their constituents. It's pretty powerful. And then maybe last, I wanna highlight crypto and AI. This is probably the most exciting area of exploration. When I, this remind, like, when I go back in time 10 years ago when I was first investing in internet companies, a lot of people would ask me, hey, do you, are you investing in an internet company or is that a non-internet company? And like today, I'm telling, I'm saying that it sounds like totally ridiculous to everyone in this, in, in this, in this room. Everything is an internet company. Everyone asks me today, are you investing in AI and are you invest, or are you investing in crypto or non-AI? And I'm just like, this, I obviously see where this is going. Crypto and AI each will be two of the most powerful growth sectors in the coming decade and the intersection of them even more so. Why is that? Well, I think philosophically, you have to start with AI creates abundance and blockchain creates scarcity. So philosophically, they're very synergistic. And there are a lot of very specific ways that I think AI can uniquely enable blockchain. One is open systems. You know, the reality is that open systems, open models can produce better models in theory than closed source models. That's why you're seeing the success of Meta's Llama and you have the success of DeepSeek. And crypto is perfectly created to incentivize open source coordination and open source creation. Next. When I think about what AI needs to grow, like in the, melting pot of, in, in the melting pot of AI, when I'm cooking AI, you need three things. You need energy, you need data, you need compute. Man, there are deep in protocols tackling each of these sectors and doing really well in expanding each of those things, each of those resources. And the third is the idea of identity. You know, the reality is I'm pretty happy to use you know, robots or robots or automated services for a lot of my life. But at some point, like if I were dating or if I was you know, chatting with, uh, trying to have a good conversation with someone, I want to know I'm talking to a human. And so the need to, de the demand to know who you're talking to or that you're talking to a human only increases over time. For government services, they want to know they're interfacing with humans. What better way to create an open permissionless censorship resistant layer of identity than using blockchain? So we're really excited about all these areas uh, that we're investing in. And you know, it really informs our long-term outlook, which is that we are incredibly positive about where we are. I think this year is really a year about many headwinds becoming tailwinds. Or, or sorry, many headwinds now becoming tailwinds, right? Starting with political and regulatory. Two years ago, the SEC was very, very anti-crypto. Today, it's totally different. Crypto was a swing vote. There was, there was now bicameral and bipartisan agreement to push forward US legislation. That means both the Republicans and Democrats, so it's not just a Trump thing. Both the House and Senate, so not just one congressman, are all pushing towards legislation in mid-August. Next is capital flows. When I talk to allocators today, a lot of them used to tell me last year, hey, I, like, I'm the crypto guy at, at, at XYZ Endowment. I really like crypto, but I'm kind of scared to bring it up in investment committee because, I don't know, it may not work out. And I don't want to get fired. This year, if you don't bring up crypto in your investment committee and the U.S. president is talking about it, you are not doing your fiduciary duty. You have to talk about it. So it's a massive sea change in how people are approaching this. 
Fundamentals, we walked through a bunch of these. Users are growing, developers are growing, and importantly, free cash flow. What we care the most about, revenue is growing. Innovation accelerating, we talked about DeFi, we talked about AI, we talked about all the ways that TradFi is bridging DeFi. And then there are all these really strong macro tail ones pushing us forward. I really think the digital assets industry is on the cusp of hitting escape velocity. Thank you guys for the time.